And now I would like to introduce to you poet Fred Marchand. Fred comes from the Boston area. He is a poet and a professor of English at Suffolk University, where he's also the director of creative writing and co-director of the Poetry Center. Among many other good works he does for the world in the name of poetry. And a few others include longtime teaching affiliate at the William Joyner Center for Study of War and Social Consequences at UMass Boston, co-translator of poetry by Vietnamese poet Tran Dong Qua of Hanoi, Vietnam. He is the editor of Another World Instead, Early Poems of William Stafford, Stafford who wrote while a conscientious objector of World War II. Fred himself, in 1970 was one of the first Marine Corps officers honorably dis discharged as a con conscientious objector. He is the author of a number of books of poetry, most recently The Looking House, named by Barnes & Noble Review and San Francisco Chronicle as one of the best books of poetry in 2009. And he has received a number of other poetry book awards as well. Fred is here today to speak with us on poetry of pacifism. So please help me welcome Fred Marshall. Many of you may never have heard of a man named A.J. Musty, M-U-S-T-E. He was the longtime director of an organization you might have heard of, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Fellowship of Reconciliation in this country is one of the really old time pacifist organizations. It was actually founded in England in World War I and then started the chapter here. Musty was the head of FOR when uh, World War II was on and then continued on into the 50s in the Cold War and he, um, he died after two shortly after, two, no connection, but shortly after two visits to Vietnam, 1966 and 1967, first to Hanoi and then to Saigon. Um, and so to his very, you know, his very last days, he was an extraordinarily active um, pacifist and, um, and religious thinker. I think that's probably the best way to characterize him. A year ago, or maybe under a year ago, last February, I was invited to go to Hope College in Michigan uh, and give a talk, the annual A.J. Musty Lecture. And, but this time, and often it's about sociological and historic and, and, um, and religious dimensions, but I was asked by the, the folks there to talk about poetry and pacifism. And so what I'm going to do today is a kind of you know, radically condensed and slightly curved version of that. Now some of you may remember that uh, about a year ago, in the height of Occupy movements around the country and world, there was um, an occasion in which the Berkeley police decided that they would clear out the area um, in front of Sproul Hall. And it was at nighttime. And Robert Haas, poet laureate of the United, past poet laureate of the United States, and his wife, Brenda Hillman, another great poet, um, both had students there. They both teach in the area, and he at Berkeley and she at St. Mary's. And so they decided to go down to the demonstration site. And you can, you can Google um, um, the occasion of um, Hillman, Haas, Berkeley police brutality and get the whole 10 minute video done by a cell phone. But it is extraordinary and I think so meaningful in terms of poetry, um, what happens in this. There is some police brutality, at, you know, in terms of you know, gross and crude violence, not so much, some hitting and pushing. Um, but you can see, and I'll hold it up for the camera, you can see that in this little snippet of a photograph that I cut out of my, for, you know, for this, you can see Bob Hass in the foreground with his hat, and you can see his wife, Brenda Hill, slightly behind him. And then you can see some of the policemen with their riot gear uh, in front of them. And the students are sitting down. You can't quite see them. And there are a lot of students behind Hass and Brenda. And they're all sort of jostling and yelling. Now you can see Bob is talking. You know, he's, he's, I'm sure that he's, he, he would be so glad to see this still photograph, right? All throughout this, he and Brenda clearly have made a decision about how to approach uh, the Berkeley riot police. They kept shouting, and I quote them, use your heads, use your heads. 
There is no reason to hurt these people. Use your heads. And this does go, it runs right through the entire eight or nine minutes of the video. And when I first saw it, and I am friends with both of these folks, and close friends, and I care deeply about them, and I was so moved. And I was so struck by the oddity of the remark. You know, like, I, I thought, God, what an amazing thing to say at such a moment of high tension. Use your heads. And that started me thinking about a lot of things, actually. Uh, things that go back quite a ways to the Trojan War and, uh, and, and Homer's Iliad. Um, I, the rest of some of this material comes out of my introduction to Another World instead, William Stafford's early poetry, and that was time, especially those poems written while he was a CO in World War II. But I also teach the Iliad, and I've often taught this one moment in, um, in book six of the Iliad, which has just kind of haunted me. There's a couple of others that haunt me, but this one is really kind of lovely and strange. I'll set the scene, I won't read all of this, but I'll set the scene for you. You know who Menelaus was, he's the wronged king, Helen was his wife, she's run off with Paris to try, precipitating the war. Menelaus gets into a sword fight with a guy, a Trojan, whose, um, their fathers have been friends, it's the same culture anyway, and their fathers have been friends. And Menelaus bests him, he puts him on the ground, this guy's name is Adrestus. And, and, and Adrista says, oh, he wraps his hands around his knees and says, oh, don't, our fathers were such close friends. He says, don't, don't, don't kill me. And Menelaus starts to say, well, okay, maybe I'll just send him back as a prisoner of war to the ships. And then the, the quote that I gave for you here occurs, when uprushed Agamemnon. He says, you know, did they treat you so nicely, those Trojans? Why, you, why do you want to send him back? Why do you want to let him live? And then he says, uh, would to God, this is Agamemnon speaking, would to God not one of them could escape. He could escape his pl sudden plunging death beneath our hands. No baby boy still in his mother's belly. Not even he would escape. All Troy blotted out. No tears for their lives, no markers for their graves. Now, there are so many things to be said about this, but not the least of which is these two things. This, of course, is a description of genocide, isn't it? It is really, you know, the idea of eradicating a people. And then secondly, and this is where the strangest aspect of Homer comes in. This is a, an epic about military and martial virtue, and there are virtues of all sorts. But there, and this perhaps is the most, the purest version of military enforcement. And there is no lout, no, no guy in this, in this epic who is more, um, more, more pilloried by Homer than Agamemnon. He's probably the worst general that's ever lived. Manipulative, dishonest, and, and clearly someone that Homer does not like. And I've always been haunted by the fact that, that the person who is least admirable gets to, this, this, gets to say this in Homer. And I had a thought after that. I thought, you know, somewhere inside of the imagination of this epic is an idea that Menelaus wasn't all wrong to have a soft heart. Now, I don't want to make a big deal out of this and say that Homer is a pacifist. He wasn't. This, the, the, the epic is not about pacifism. But it is about that moment that occurred where Adristos pleads for his life and Menelaus says, well, maybe. And his brother says, no, forget it. Now, I'm going to jump from the Trojan War to World War II. Some of you may know uh, and have heard of Simone um, Weil, is how you say, the, say her name. W, you know, while it sounds like, but Simone Weil. She was a philosopher. She was um, uh, a born Jewish, converted to Catholicism. She was um, a serious Catholic thinker throughout her adult life and also a serious, committed social activist as well as a thinker. And she was a great literary critic. And she wrote one of the most important essays on the Iliad that exists. And I recommend it to you this afternoon. Uh, there's a moment in it uh, that, that caught my eye as I, as I studied the topic and trying to think through what the connection between poetry and pacifism might be. She's writing about the Iliad uh, as after Poland has already been invaded and half of France is coming under occupation. And she's in the south of France. Um, that's before she flees to England in 1941. And she says, 
And she's talking about the Nazis and she's talking about uh, the Trojan War at the same time. To those who seem to have force on their side, their own destruction seems impossible. Since other people don't impose on their movements that halt, and the bold is mine, that halt, that interval of hesitation wherein lies all our consideration for our brothers and humanities, they, the people who have, think they have force on their side, they conclude that destiny has given complete license to them and none at all to their inferiors. You know, I look through those lines and I see the tanks and I also see, of course, the, the Trojan War and the, the back and forth of that. But most of all, I see this insight into the importance of a moment of hesitation, such as Menelaus had. This connected with me in a very real way. When I first started writing poems, I, came, I read William Stafford's Traveling Through the Dark. Many of you know this poem, and I only did an excerpt here. It's a relatively short poem, but I really want to keep within the time limit. But I'll describe the poem, and then I'll read the, the key moment. It's a poem. William Stafford uh, lived in the Pacific Northwest, in the Portland, Oregon area. And uh, this is a poem in which he's driving up the Wilson River Road to the mountains, and he comes across a dead deer in the road, and um, um, he gets out of the car, and, you know, well, okay, you know, you know, somebody's got to do something that might make more people dead run, to run into this. So he, he reaches down, he touches the deer, presumably to move it, and he realizes the deer has a fawn inside, alive. And so, this is where it picks up. My fingers touching her side brought me the reason. Her side was warm. Her fawn lay there waiting, alive, still, never to be born. Beside that mountain road, I hesitated. The car aimed ahead its lowered parking lights. Under the hood purred the steady engine. I stood in the glare of the warm exhaust turning red, and around our group I could hear the wilderness listen. I thought hard for us all, my only swerving, and then pushed her over the edge into the river. And so, so I want you to notice there's, there's, a, there's a lovely set of dashes around that swerving. All right, I, I don't you love those dashes? I wrote a whole paper on, those, on Stafford's dashes. He inherits them from Emily Dickinson, her sense of the dash. In any case, it is a paradigmatic moment of hesitation. And so I started to think about Simone Weil and Menelaus and, um, and William Stafford, and then I kind of tried to draw a line underneath and add them up. You know, what, what were they trying to tell me? And it was around that time that I actually did start the editing of William Stafford's um, Another World Instead. And these, this collection of poems really is uh, centered on his, um, his four and a half uh, years in the civilian public service as a CO during World War II. And, and I started to see that what, whatever that meant in terms of the larger historical facts of our time, there was this strange way in which for these COs, that was in fact an interval of hesitation. They may have been very committed pacifists, but in some way in the larger picture of things, there was a place outside of the driving forces of history um, in which they tried to do some good work, as some of them in a more religious vein would say, be a saving remnant of their viewpoint. Stafford was not a religious uh, CEO. He was a um, more secular Emersonian kind of conscientious subjective, but he had a good appreciation of those CEOs. And this is my favorite poem from that book. <clears throat> this is by him in 1944. Shall we have that singing? And I'd like to just sort of like try to isolate that moment in the day. Shall we have that singing in the evening? For between the stars and our star, there is no one, and we must sleep again. We rest the hands, not dangerous, on the wool, and we place pillows under the turning head. Quietly now, no moving. Was there something forgotten? The losing one neglects and calls it winning. Help each other. Have that singing in the evening. Again, I love the parentheses, which is itself a, internal to the poem, a moment of hesitation and you know, reflection. I included a couple of older poems of mine, which you're welcome, and they're in, they're in books, you can see those books in the back. Um, but what I'd like to do as a way of celebrating what we're doing here is that 
race through my experience as a CEO, it's not that important in this context, and really go to the occupied moment. And, and, and as we all know, as anyone had anything to do with it, it is one of the great joys of every Occupy site was the sign making, the sign tent, et cetera, et cetera. So could I ask for some help in those of you who have light? I'd like different people to read the signs that I've listed here as if they were haiku. We can call them Occupy coup. <laughs> I'll start with the first one, just to give you a sense. You don't, we don't want to rush this. These are signs that we're turning into poems. Or, you know, as I said in my note to Cheryl, they're kind of poems already, only, you know, they're just getting ready to be called such, right? First one, dear capitalism, it's not you, it's us. Just kidding, it's you. <laughs> I mean, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Would, would someone? Would my would my colleagues come up here and read these read these next three, please? Wouldn't that be best? Make sure you do the mic though. Everything is okay. Actually, that that one goes with the both the second. Oh, part. I'm sorry. They, they, they just threw a <laughs> line. Let me do it again. The, yeah. Everything is okay. Please continue shopping. <laughs> You have the right to remain silent, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah. You say it. No. You told me. The only thing that trickles down was your <laughs> It was actually asterisked on the sign, but I think that, you know, since we all know, right, uh, we should say it. Uh, and then finally, which is truly one of my favorites ever. For those of you who don't remember the journalistic attitudes toward the Occupy movement, one of the things that the sort of the, the, the right wing was saying, you're not clear about what you want. So there was this guy in uh, Zuccotti Park who had a sign, just completely wrote it himself, he's completely not very visible. There's, this, there's a photo of him, he says, we're here, we're unclear, get used to it. <laughs> And of course, there's a great echo of gay liberation in that, isn't there, you know? I thought of these as, as um, not just proto-poetry or folk poetry, but as moments of arresting consciousness. And that's what people loved doing about making signs. They were making, with words, ways of having people pause for a minute, even hesitate. You know, taxi cab guys driving by, for instance, who would see a sign they liked and honk, right? You know, or people yelling even. And it struck me that that too is deeply connected to Menelaus and Simone Weil and William Stafford. So I'll end up with a poem of mine that I wrote on the last day of the Dewey Square. Um, you'll see that I typed it up the other night and there's lots of typos in it, but I'll skip over them. You'll just, you can make the corrections as you wish. It's called Shepherd's Field. And that Shepherd's Field is actually the translation of that place outside of Bethlehem called Betzahur in Arabic. Shepherd's Field. Black plastic garbage bags flapping and winter wind said to be high tonight. Half the spaces without tents and tarps, a naked ground. Rain-soft dirt underfoot, the rest dull paving stones. The square's colors muted, quiet as the handful left, those who have decided to be arrested, who remain stacking the camp library. In the meditation tent, someone takes a nap, his legs straight out, kicking as if in a bad dream, perhaps of the sheer glass walls, the higher offices, the brick parapets of our vertical city, the banca, the lender's tables, their shaven servants at the windows looking down at police in lime green day glow vests, unflappable as their horses. A film project in mind, a man is shooting the billowing shapes that tents will take when the frames are pulled, the nylon full sails filling up. There is no fear anywhere. 
only a sense that the first part is over. In a wooden box in the sign tent, magic markers, bundles of brown cardboard, slogans of a birth pain wit, a language of differing ends and what decent means, the words now packed and ready to go under the chime of the South Station clock, a winter sun low and thin over this city's Bet Sahur, place of the night watch and manger. Thank you. War Zone. A ruffed grouse risks detection on the meadow and clicks commands to her three half-grown chicks who scavenge random seeds and bugs and ticks close by. A fancied bullet, beak, or arrow makes her tip her head to check the sky for trolling hawks, the bushes for the slouch of booted feet. A hint from her, they'll crouch beneath the trees. She gives a chur. They fly like people under siege to a nearby oak and watch an eagle slant across the field. They hunch below sparse leaves their only shield, till empty stomachs goad them to provoke honed claws or bow or gun that's aimed in need or pressed in service to capricious greed. Thank you. Asphodel. After the words of Penny Turner, Nymphion, Greece. Our guide turned in her saddle, broke the spell. You ride now through a field of asphodel, the flower native to the plains of hell. Across just such a field, the pale shade came of proud Achilles, who had preferred a name and short life to a long life without fame. And summoned by Odysseus, he gave this wisdom, better by far to be a slave among the living than great among the grave. I used to wonder, how did such a bloom become associated with the tomb? Then one evening, walking through the gloom, I noticed a strange fragrance. It was sweet, like honey, but with hints of rotting meat. An army of them bristled at my feet.
let the chance of love go by. Masters, many colony, many command center, constantly battling, antagonizing each other, more territory, more authority, more loyalty, oppressing, ridiculing, belittling, snoop, snooping, tearing apart the little flame of a unique self. Thank you. Peach and pear, apricot, then this. 